Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We want to thank you so very much, Lord, for allowing us to praise and to worship you, Lord. And thank you for your wonderful Holy Spirit, your presence, Lord, being here with us. Lord, I want to pray for each family, each person, Lord, who gave their tithing and offering to you as an act of worship. I want to pray blessings upon them and their families. I want to pray for each person here, Lord, today. They'll completely die to their will and die to their flesh. I pray, Lord, that you open up their spiritual ears and eyes. They can see and hear and understand, Lord, your word. I pray for myself, Lord, that I completely die to my will. And I pray, Lord, for an unlimited portion of your anointing power, your spirit to flow through me and upon me, to allow the, the word to flow here this morning. To someone here that needs to be born again or healed or set free or delivered from anything, Lord, let them accept you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God put this message on my heart a couple weeks ago and didn't know exactly when I should preach it. And, um, and what started it was, you guys know what we do here in our church is every single year on God's biblical calendar, which what we use is not the biblical calendar. What we have in America is the Gregorian calendar. So what I look at is God's biblical calendar as well and we always celebrate God's holy feast days. And the reason we do that is because that's what Christ came here to fulfill. That's all in Scripture. Okay? And we always teach that biblically. And God said that's holy and it's forever, that kind of thing. But one thing that's coming up in September of 18th and 19th is going to be Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. Now one of the teachings that we always talk about there is, that's why I'm teaching this today, is 30 days from September 18th and 19th backwards, which fell this past week, around Tuesday, what God told the Israelites to do was, for 30 days, you're supposed to examine yourself. You're supposed to look at yourself. You're supposed to see where you stand with God. See, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. How many knows that you can be saved with God be born again, but have no relationship with him whatsoever. It's the same thing with a married couple. You can be married on paper, but have no relationship whatsoever. It's the same thing with God. God's not going to force a relationship upon you. And uh, what we call August is, is going to be the month of Elul, is, is, what the, is what the biblical calendar is. And for 30 days, they are preparing. They're looking at themselves. They're reflecting on themselves. They're putting things into order. Um, in other words, getting a, a right relationship with God makes you look and reflect upon yourself. Um, and what it really means is giving serious thoughts or consideration the acts of looking thoughtfully at something for a long time, deep, reflective thoughts. My question to you, do you ever do, you ever do that? <laughs> but if you do, now's a good time to do it. Why? Because as we get closer to the end times, which we're definitely getting there, it could be this year, it could be the next year, or whenever, I don't know, when the Lord comes back for his church. But one thing he told his people to do was, to reflect and look at your relationship with me, okay? So I'm asking you to do that. And that's why it's important about this message right here because God showed me something uh, that's really important that we understand this. Your worldview determines your relationship with God. Again, not whether you're saved or not, but your relationship. And people say, well, I don't have no idea what you're talking about. I don't have a worldview. Yeah, you do. Everybody in this room has a worldview. That's why you see the eye looking at the, 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 the earth right here. You might not understand it all, but I'm going to explain it to you what the Bible has to say about it. You do have a worldview. And what you don't realize is, is we as Christians are supposed to have a biblical worldview, not just a worldview. And the problem we're having is, is that there's a non-biblical worldview and then there's a biblical worldview. And a lot of Christians now are kind of meeting in the middle. And they are pushing away God's biblical worldview and going over to the non-biblical worldview of the world and thinking everything's okay, I'm still saved. Yeah, you are. 
but you have lost your relationship with God and you will continue losing it. Have you ever asked yourself the question, I'm praying and I'm getting no answers. Why don't I feel God? Why am I not? Well, they, this, this might be it. You can still be saved and born again, but when you get out from under God's biblical worldview and you get out from under God's ways of doing things and try to mix in with the world things, you're going to start feeling less and less and less of God. You're still saved. You're still saved. You're still born again. You're still sealed to, to the day of redemption. Look at it like your friend or your neighbor or your, your wife, husband. You can be married to them, but do you really have a relationship with them? Okay, you see, this is why it's important to know, understand what I want to show you here. So look at first of all Colossians 2, Colossians 2 verses 8. Here's what, here's what the Bible says about this. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. Under the word the world, and it says, and not after Christ. So stop right here. Already God's dividing. God is dividing. So we're not supposed to divide. Yes, you are. Get that through your head right now. Okay? Dark and lightness does not mix. Good and bad does not mix. Okay? God is not about a happy medium here. You're either going to be for Christ or the world. Who is the God of this world? Satan, whether you like it or not, he is. So it's supposed to be about Christ and not the world. God's dividing in here, not me. Okay? So understand what I'm fixing to show you here, Christians. You, you can love God. The problem we're having today is you ask 90% of the people I hear if they're Christians. You, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. That does not make you a Christian. The devil believes in Jesus. Many of folks believe in God. That is not salvation. Unless you are born again believer and his spirit is put inside you, hear me, you cannot have a biblical worldview. But if you do have, a, have the Holy Spirit inside you, you should have a biblical worldview inside your body right now, inside your temple of God. And the things that God says are bad, you should say they're bad. The things that God says are good, you should say they're good. Whether you understand them or not. Does that make any sense? I'm going to show you deeper here as, as we go through this because this is really important for all of us because every year I try to examine myself because even though I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, I still have flesh. How about you? I still go through emotional problems. I still go through all kinds of issues in my life. We all do. we human beings. And Satan looks for every single little crack or crevice to get in, don't he? And when he does, he'll try to mess you up. It don't change who you are in Christ, but it can definitely change my relationship with God, and I don't want that. So everybody in the whole world has a worldview, whether you know it or not. Here's what a worldview is. It's a particular philosophy of life or conceptions of the world that we live in. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I found this on the internet. I thought this is cool, so I wrote, I wrote this down so I can make sure you can kind of see it in a way. If you take an apple and you set it on a kitchen table, okay, an artist would look at that apple and see it one way as a still life and wants to start drawing it. A grocer or someone who works in the retail industry will see it as inventory and wants to sell it. A kid will see it as lunch and wants to eat it. It's still an apple on the table, but you see it in different ways. Are you seeing that? That's exactly what God is saying about your worldview. How do you see it? And if what you see does not match up with what God sees, your relationship will suffer. Does that make any sense? Does it, mean you're, it doesn't mean you're not saved, but your relationship will suffer with God. So if you're not feeling God or understanding why you're, you're not hearing from God as much, it could be this very reason. So you got to understand. For, for, for example, how many of you have been on a mission trip? Anybody? You know what's like? If you go on a mission trip, your worldview might broaden. It's like Katie's been on cruise. Your worldview might broaden. 
because you see other parts of the world. If you go on a mission trip and you see how folks live and you're thinking, man, I am so blessed, and you look at this kind of stuff, you'll start seeing other cultures all around you, right? It means your, your worldview is broadening, and there's nothing wrong with that. But <laughs> let's kind of go deeper into this. It, here's what a worldview really is. It's a collection of attitudes, values, stories, um, uh, anything around you that you see about the world system, um, especially what, what the people goes into now is, is what expressed in your ethics, your philosophy, your scientific beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, all this makes up your worldview. If you don't believe in God, then you're not going to have God's worldview. Does that make any sense? So then in other parts of the country, you're going to have a different worldview. But here's the bottom line. God Almighty has a biblical Christian worldview. And if you don't understand that worldview, you're going to live your life as a Christian if you are saved, all mixed up of how you're supposed to believe, how you're supposed to live your life. And God don't want that to happen to you because all through His Scripture, it's in here. It's all about His worldview. So I want to make sure because a lot of Christians are doing something, and I used to do the same thing. We are doing something the Bible calls being lukewarm. We're riding the fence. I love you, God. I am saved. I believe in you and all these things. I go to church. I pray, all this kind of stuff. But then you look over here in the world, and we're in the world, but honey, we're not of it. But yet we start compromising with the world system. We've all done it, guys, whether you believe it or not, we have. We start compromising and we meet in the middle. And when you start meeting in the middle with God, you've got a problem. Okay? God, listen, I was told a long time ago, and this is so true. Greg, if your relationship with God is suffering, it's not God's fault. He hasn't moved. You have. Think about that. God don't move. God's love is still the same. God's mercy is still the same. His relationship with you is still the same. Okay? If anybody has moved, it's, it's you. Does that make any sense? God is not going to compromise His word. He's not going to compromise His truth to meet you in the middle and say, well, this is okay. In other words, it don't matter how much society changes, guys, because you can go all the way back to the 1900s, 1920s, 50s, all the way up till now, and can you not see how our worldview, our system, our schools, our jobs, our families, everything has changed. Guess who's not changed? God has not changed. His word has not changed. But people's worldview has changed. This is why it's so, you know, it's so important to see this. So now go over to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Again, let the word speak for itself, guys. See, I, I, don't, I don't argue with people about God's word. God's word says, amen. How many believe that God's word is real? If you, I've always said, if you don't believe God's word is real, then don't call yourself a Christian. Just stop because you're not going to go to heaven. You're, not, you're just playing games. You'll be one of the ones left here on this earth during the seven-year tribulation period who might believe in God but never got born again and you'll have to get your head lobbed off because you're too stubborn to give in to the Holy Spirit while you're here now. I'm going to say it straight out. If you're going to, be, if you're going to give in to God now, you're going to be persecuted now by the world system. If the world does not hate you, you're doing something wrong. Hello? It's getting quiet. If the world does not hate you and don't like what you stand for, you're doing something wrong. If the world loves you, you're in the wrong place. You're not where God wants you to be. Look at, look at what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and look at verses 15 through 17. This is God's word. Love not the world. Does that mean I'm supposed to hate everybody? No, that's not what it's talking about at all. I can love a murderer, a homosexual, a thief, an adulterer. I can love anybody. I can love you. But I don't mean I'm supposed to love your ways. I'm not supposed to love what you do. Because what you do, if it goes against God, it goes against God. Period. It doesn't matter. 
And love is not compromised in meeting in the middle and say, well, what your truth is is for you and what my truth is for me. No, you're going to send that person to hell because you're completely going against God's biblical views. Look at what it says here. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father, Papa, God, is not in them. Hear this in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Now watch what it says here. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How do you do the will of God? It's not just to say, I'm a Christian, and that's it. Do the will of God is to have a biblical worldview and do it. Stand upon it and believe in it. Well, gosh, if you lose everybody in your life, it doesn't really, doesn't really, really matter. That's hard. I'm telling you right now, if you have a biblical worldview, you will lose some friends. You will lose some family. You will might, might even lose your job. But God's watching. Where do you stand? God's also watching if you're compromising in the middle. I'm just showing you what, what God's put on my heart here, guys. This is why we're supposed to examine ourselves for 30 days prior to these feast days. This is the whole point of this message. What worldview do you have? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, let God's word speak for itself. And it always does, hallelujah. And it steps on my toes, guys, just as much as it steps on your toes, I promise you. As I go through these messages and I'm going through them, it's hard because I have to be convicted. I have to go through the same things you might be feeling right now before I even preach it. So remember, when I'm teaching and preaching, I'm teaching and preaching to myself because I'm just like you are. I'm human just like you are. But I will, I refuse, I'm not ever going to get up behind this pulpit and try to please man and not hear from God and, and not say what the Bible has to say about it. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and go to verses 14. This is why it's so horrible. I'm fixing to show you. Okay? How many here knows that you can be in the world but not of it? How many here know that you can love people but not love what they do? How many here agrees with that? Okay? Now, what does that mean? I'm supposed to go hide it in a shack somewhere? No, I'm not supposed to go hide in a shack. But at the same time, I'm not supposed to be like they are either. I'm not supposed to go out here and become what they are trying to reach them because now you're trying to be the Holy Ghost and you're not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is inside you and you are, you are acceptable just like everybody else to fall in the flesh and to, to have yourself hurt if you ain't careful. So what does the Bible say about that? Look at here, 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, verses 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Period. Does that mean you can't go to school and sit in the classroom with them? Yes, go sit in the classroom with them. Go to your job and work with them. Go do what you got to do with them. But do not open yourself up to them and open your heart up to them and open up your spiritual being up to them and let them in. No, that's not what you do. If you do, you're yoked to them. When you get yoked to someone, now you're in danger. Look at this. I don't say this. God says this. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Baal? And what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God, which is you, with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and there shall be my people. Wherefore, come out, the Bible says, from among them, and be ye separate. And it means be ye separate. It don't mean 50 yards away from them. It means when people are looking at 20 folks in, in, a, in a room, and you're sitting here as a Christian, and there's 19 more people left, people should look at you and say, that person's different. We we'll all fit to go to, to the bar and get drunk and have a good old time and party and do all these things. Let's, let's ask everybody, but no, let's don't ask this person because they, they're, they're going to say no. Why? Because they're different. They're different. Something's different about them. They want to know what you have that they don't have. If you're just like they are, then why do they want to serve your God? 
They don't want to serve your God because they see you as fake. They see you as fake. Look at this. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean. Now the word thing, just mark it out. That's, that, that, that was added there. Touch not the unclean. I will receive you. Watch this now. And you will be a father, be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord of God Almighty. Again, everybody here has a worldview. But how are we looking at it? Most people look at it through like rose-colored glasses, trying to live their life of how they want it to be and what they think is right. But God says, look at your life, what you walk and do through God's view. You're supposed to be looking at it through God's biblical view. What would Jesus Christ do here? What would God say here? And you know the Holy Ghost is inside you if you're born again. And the Holy Spirit all the time screams at you. What are you saying? What are you doing? What are you doing here? This kind of thing. That's how you know the Holy Spirit's there. Don't mean you're not going to mess up. You will mess up. But overall, do you have a biblical worldview? Do you know what God's biblical even worldview is? In other words... There is good and bad, there is light and darkness, there is wrong and there is right. Now, God showed me three biblical, three, quote, factors that, that goes into a biblical worldview, so I'm going to give them to you now. Here's bottom line. Truth, how many here knows that there is an absolute truth? The world says there is no absolute truth. My truth, my truth, your truth, your truth. It doesn't matter what I say or what you say. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what your, what your truth is. Your truth don't mean, don't mean a hill of beans. Well, it does for me, great, just for you. But there is an absolute moral biblical truth from the creator of the heavens and the earth, hallelujah, God Almighty, and his truth is final, period. My question to you is, do you line up with his truth? Truth, listen to this, God's opinion, not mine. See, that's why it's so easy for me. People get mad at me all the time. I take the blunt of it all the time, preaching and stuff. But I say, listen, I'm, I, I love you. I'm not coming against you. This ain't my opinion. You're either going to have to fight against God <laughs> of what God's word says. Do you believe it or not? Because you can't have both. You cannot sit here and look me in the face and say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I'm this. I'm this. And then take his word and throw it off to the side and say, well, here's what my opinion is. No, you can't do that. Now you're a fake Christian. Now you have another gospel. Now you have gone completely against God's biblical view and you will not go to heaven that way. I promise you. See, you take God's word and present it to someone with love, with love, 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 love. Don't attack nobody but with, with love. The word will work for itself. The Holy Ghost will do the work for you guys. How many believe that? But I ain't budging. I'm not going to compromise with you. See, every time we sin or mess up, y'all, y'all been there here. This we all officially get squirmy here. When we all sin or mess up, don't you want to find somebody to agree to agree with you? Let's get real with it. If you mess up, do something stupid, and instead of coming to the to the realization, I've messed up and I'm I'm an idiot. I've done something dumb. We all trying to find folks around us to agree with us to make you feel better. Is that not right? That's what happens with folks all the time. And it don't last long. After a while, you realize you got all these folks sitting around here feeling sorry for themselves, and we're all no good. We're all no good. We're all no good. And God's like, really? Here's my standard. You are my child. I put my spirit inside you. I have died for you. I've given myself for you. And you're walling over here in the mud like a pig. When you finally get out of that mud, I'm waiting on you over here. But God doesn't move. Does not make any sense? So I want you to understand. Look at 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. It's God's opinion. His truth does matter. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, your opinion does not matter about God's Word. But this is what it means to me. It doesn't matter. It's fake. God's Word has a meaning. It's a spiritual meaning. And your opinion doesn't matter. Does that make any sense? And I'm not being me when I say that. You cannot take God's word and pull it out of context and say, well, here's what it means for me. Now, I'm telling you, a lot of religious folks here does it all the time. A lot of religion people who, who want to try to make God on their side, 
out of context, pull scripture out of context and twist it around to fit their narrative. When you do that, that's of the devil. Look at what this right here says. Knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God's word is by the Holy Ghost. It is from God and put it in context and that's what it's telling you. So God's word is real, it's truth, it is right. How many here believes that? That doesn't mean I can always live up to it. No, no, I can't. I'm, I'm going to fail just like you are sometimes. I'm going to fall over and stumble and all these kind of things. We all do. But guess what? I pick myself back up. I know who I am in Christ. It doesn't change the fact whether I even understand it or not. Whether I even like it or not, doesn't matter. God's word is true, and God put it here, and he's right, period. Does that make any sense? That is a biblical worldview that we've got to have. The next part is this right here, and here's the hardest part. Y'all ready for this one? Not only knowing that God's word is real, it is truth, it's his opinion, not ours, the next part to have a biblical worldview is this. Submit, submission to God's terms and not yours. Submission to God's terms and not yours. Oh, it's easy to sit here and say, I believe in God's word and yes, sir, but doing it is a different story. Knowing the truth about one thing, guys, is something, but submitting to it is different. Does that make any sense? It's just like husbands and wives. Okay, what does God tell you wives to do if you have a biblical, godly marriage? And I say if, because if you don't, it's not even talking about you. In the Bible, a godly man, a godly woman. What does it tell you, tell you, tell you, tell you to do in the Bible? The woman is supposed to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. You're not doing it because your husband's saying, Psh, do what I say, lady. No, you're doing it as unto the Lord because of your position in Christ. When you do, you'll get more power than if you try to fight back. That's what the Bible says. Now, that does not add up at all with the world system. Feminism out here in the world today says, we don't need old men in our lives. That's what that's what, that's what this is, right? Okay. That means you have a worldly devil worldview and not a biblical worldview. It's this that simple. I don't care how you fly. You don't want, please don't go out here and say, I'm a godly Christian biblical feminist woman. Feminism of the world system now is of the devil. Be careful. I'm all for equal rights and pay and all that kind of stuff. You can say those words without being in the group of, fe of feminism. Because when you do... You're going to start hating men. You're going to start hating the system. You're going to start hating what God says versus what, are y'all seeing this? What the world says. So what view do you have? I'm just trying to show what the Bible really says, guys. This is so important that you get a hold of what God's Word's really talking about here. So you can say, I believe it, but submitting to it and doing it is a whole different thing. Amen? It's quiet. 2 Timothy 3.16 all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Everybody here, I hope and pray at one point in your life that either God or a pastor or a friend or a neighbor or someone has come to you and has corrected you or instructed you or have given you advice with God's word. And at that point, what do you do? You either push it away I said, I don't care what it says. I'm going to do my own thing. Fine, then you're on your own. When you do that, God's relationship with you is cut off. How many here believe that you can have the Holy Spirit of God in you and be a Christian and yet never, never feel his presence? Why? Because you're doing your own thing versus God's thing. That's exactly what the Bible's talking about here. It happens all the time. Now, the next thing is, if you get those parts right in your life, here's the next part. And this is the whole point of the message is relationship. How many here wants a relationship with God? Okay? Relationship. You love God, you love people. You love God, you love people. And again, you must define what that means. I love God, I love people. Now watch. I love God, I'm going to do your will, Lord, whatever it is. Tell me what to say, what to do. I believe your word. If I'm the last one here standing, I still believe your word. Love people. I'm going to love everybody out here with a God they love. Can you hear me? 
I'm going to love you church, you Christians, with a brotherly spiritual love because you're part of the DNA, the family, because you've been born again. But the world's not. I'm going to still love them. But love is not compromise. Love is not giving into. Love is not um, going over to the other side and call that love. That's not love. But the other side will tell you, if you don't let me do what I want to do, it ain't love. I hate you. Kids do it all the time. If I can't get my way, I'm going to pitch a fit. You mean mama, you mean daddy. Y'all, y'all been there, right? Y'all seen that. That's how folks operate. Look, look over at Matthew 22. Watch this. Matthew 22. Again, God's word speaks for itself. And look at verses 37 through 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments bring all the law and all the prophets. So, let me kind of put it in a nutshell for you. Okay? Let's just say you're living in a neighborhood and you meet your neighbor who's not a Christian. But you're wanting to be a good neighbor, Christian. What do you do? You love God. You love your neighbor as yourself. You treat them with respect. You're kind to them. You do whatever you can to make them feel welcome. Right? All these things. Invite them over to eat. Help cut the grass if you want to. That's fine. But do not open yourself up spiritually to that person until the Holy Spirit tells you to because they're not your brother and sister in Christ. Does that make any sense? Don't become the Holy Ghost. Let let the Holy Ghost use you. Does that make any sense? You love people, but don't open yourself up because as soon as you do, things start changing. Let me give you an example. Look down next to you. You're going to have a, a sheet like this. And I, I, I drew this thing here up uh, last night, and I gave it to Miss George to type it up for me. It's going to be on the screen as well. I want you to see some differences here of what I'm talking about so you can have an idea. A worldview. And it takes faith to believe in a biblical worldview, and it also takes faith to believe in a non-biblical worldview. Example. Um, God created heaven and the earth. That's biblical worldview. Non-biblical is Big Bang Theory or evolution. There is no God. Let me stop right here. Do you know how many so-called Christians are out here who says, I'm saved, I'm born again, I believe in God, but you know what? They might have been a Big Bang. You know what? We might have evolved. You've missed it. If you are saved, you're out of God's will completely because God's word does not say that. God's word says that he created the heavens and the earth. Which one do you believe? See, the devil will always go against God's biblical worldview. Who is the God of this world system? The devil. Which one do you believe? You think you're sitting here in colleges or schools and they're teaching about God's view? No. You're in the world system. They're going to be teaching about the devil's point of view of it. Look at this right here. Either you're God-centered or you're man-centered. You choose. One's, one's biblical, one is not. We say as Christians we all have sin. The world says there is no sin. I can do what I want to. Look at Hollywood if you don't believe me. There is no sin. I was telling the kids the other day how sick this is. Now they're even coming out with a new movie called Cuties. Have y'all heard about this? Cuties on Netflix. Okay. Backed by Hollywood of 11-year-olds twerking and the parents getting mad about it and saying you shouldn't do this and they're going to do it anyway because the whole movie is about destroying the family and letting the devil run free as it always does in the world system. There's no way that you can say, I love God and I'm a Christian and I'm doing His will and watch that movie and, and, and applaud it. No, you're either not born again or you're completely out of God's will. Does that make any sense? You choose. You're not going to have both. We say we're in need of a Savior. They say they have no need of a Savior because there's no sin. We say our ultimate home is going to be heaven. Okay? They say our ultimate home is what? 
Earth is our home. Why? Because there is no heaven or hell. So that's why you see folks today fighting over the earth. Why do you think, I dare you? You've heard of that, haven't you? Oh, Greta, I dare you. Why do you think they're fighting so hard to, quote, save our planet because this is their home? They have no idea what God's Word even says about it. God's in control of our planet. Hear me, we're not going, going to, to destroy ourselves. God is going to destroy the planet. God says, I will destroy the heavens and the earth and create and bring you heaven and earth. It's not about you. God says he's in control. He knows exactly what he's doing. But yet the folks who live inside the planet, the world system, who don't believe in God, don't believe it at all. They think they're in control. Does that make any sense? So you've got to see where you, where you fall at, guys. The Bible tells me and you Christians, as hard as it is, let the Holy Ghost live inside you and to what? Be holy. Be holy. And how many of you know sometimes being holy is not easy? Okay, the next view over here, see if you fit in here. They don't say be holy. They say be happy. Be happy. Be happy. Christians, be holy. World, you be happy. Whatever makes you happy, then you do it. Your feelings. Be happy. Are you trying to show? I'm trying to show you here, guys. See, God's biblical worldview is one thing, and the world system is another. Are you putting them together? I'm asking the question. See, if you've got questions, the Bible says, you're supposed to go to God. Go to God, and you look for the answers. What does, what does the world say? Your feelings will answer the questions. What do you feel? How do you feel? See, Whatever you feel is right for you is right for you. That's the world system. And another one to look at it, God's rules are your own life, your own rules. Think about it. And I'm just showing you this to get an idea for you to examine yourself. Because I have to, listen, I can go through this list right here, and about half of them I'm right on where I'm supposed to be, and the other half I'm going to have to really, really, really think about it. That's the whole point of this, guys. For 30 days, look at yourself and examine and say, I know God loves me, I know I'm saved, but I am, am I in the will of God? Am I where I'm supposed to be? And if I fit anything over here on that right-hand side of the columns, if that right there is more important than what it says on the left, then you're not where you're supposed to be. It's just that simple. And we all go in and out of this all the time. Does this make any sense, guys? The folks don't want to hear this sometimes, but it's the truth. Don't let culture and your feelings and this kind of garbage change who you are. Go over to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm just giving you some, some, some examples here. 2 Peter 2. Look at verses 1 and 2. And here's why this is important, guys. Hear me. How many of you have ever heard of a false prophet? Okay. A false prophet don't always come in the, in, the, in the order of a pastor or a preacher. A false prophet is not going to say, hey, I'm a false prophet. A false prophet can come into the church, and it can also come into the world system, and it will, the Antichrist. And it can preach and show things in cultures and preach what we think is good or looks good on the outside. We're all supposed to follow it. It can be false teachers. Let me, give you, let me give you some examples here. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verses 1 and 2. But, the, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that, that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, for reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The way of truth shall be evil spoken of. God's biblical view is evil spoken of. When I get up behind the pulpit and preach the things I do, I get evil spoken of because it's not, it don't go with the rest of the world system. Well, duh, it shouldn't. If I'm agreeing with the world system to for everybody to like me, I'm not in God's will. Does that make any sense? Guys, if you don't see yourself in a battle, I'm a traveler, I'm just going through this world system right now, the world system is not my home, 
it, God's going to change the world system and get rid of it, and this earth will be my home eventually one day. Hallelujah. I'm in God's spiritual kingdom. If you don't see yourself that way, then you're out of God's will, period. If you fit in with the world system and that's what you want, you're not in God's will. All you've done is said a prayer one day and call yourself a Christian so you don't have to go to hell. But you're not doing God's will. God's will is for you to stand on God's word with truth, biblical truth. For example, don't get mad anymore on what I'm going to show you here, guys. Please don't, because this affects all of us. Morals, homosexuality, transgenders, black lives matters, evolution, abortion, stealing, looting, lawlessness, all roads lead to heaven. And I could go through a list a mile long. Where do you fit in with that? Marxists. Just name it, anything negative, name it. Adultery, name it, anything you can think of that's negative, where do you fit in with that? What's your opinion upon that subject? It's just like um, I was watching very little uh, of the Democratic stuff that was on TV this past week, the, the conventions or whatever, and it's amazing to me. I see things from a spiritual view, not from a practical or, or flesh view. You understand what I'm trying to say? This is how it's supposed to sit biblically. So when you're out here and you're watching baseball teams and you're watching basketball teams and you're watching all these folks take a knee to our flag, okay, to go against it over a false narrative. I've already proved that to you last week or two weeks ago. I proved it. It's false narrative. And when I say false narrative, what I mean is it's a Marxist, communist, socialist group behind it. It's, it's biblical. Read it and look at it. It's not, it's not hard, hard, hard to figure out who's trying to tear down our nation. Is our nation perfect? By no means no. No. But, but was God in the beginning of it? Yes. Have there been all kind of garbage from the, from the very beginning come through our, our society? Yes. Do I think there's evil in the Republican Party and Democratic Party? Yes. I do. It's everywhere. I'm no fool. I'm not going to follow a, a person blindly. But here's what I do know when I see things spiritually. When I'm sitting here watching on TV, when folks will not pledge to, to the flag out of, because of this reason, here's what I'm going to show you. They have the LGBTQ community and the Muslim community on TV pledge against pledge allegiance to our flag, and it got to the point where it says one nation and they left out under God. Now I know they say I've heard this or I looked at it up. That was not in the original. I got that. That was added in there 50 or 60 years later. But do you really think that the Muslim and the LGBTQ this, this community is going back to the very original and leaving out under God because they're trying to do what's right? No, they're doing it because they hate God, period. Well, because why? Because God's biblical view, God's biblical view points a light upon a transgender, upon uh, evil. I'm going to show you what the, what, what the Bible says. But yet that's uncomfortable for us. Well, so what? So What? If you're uncomfortable, God's word is God's word. 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, you didn't have these issues like we have now. They're coming out more and more and more and more. And then the false prophet comes in and teaches you through government, through presidents, all through Congress, through our schools, through our colleges, that you're supposed to accept this garbage. All the way from abortion all the way through. You name it. You can name any kind of subject and see where God's view on it is versus the world's view. And my question to you is, where do you stand? Yes, guys, I've got questions just like you do about every one of these things. You should have questions. I have a heart for people. I, I mean, I really think, how in the world did they get to this place? Why do they think what they think? I've counseled many people about this kind of stuff. Most of us have gone through some horrible things. Most people have gone through horrible things in their life from family and friends, the very closest one to them, that caused the folks to get to this place. And there's hatred built up there. But does that mean because they feel that way, God's word changes? No, God's word don't change. God's laws, God's word is still right. Whether you like it or don't like it. Your feelings don't change that. Does that make any sense to anybody? This is what we got to look at. So my question is, as you're examining yourself, where do you fit in? Look at Ephesians 4. 
Because I'm going to tell you something. I've done it many a times where I've met in the middle with people. And when I did, I was wrong. I was wrong. If I compromise on anything with someone and the Bible says something different, then I'm saying, God, you almost got it right. But I'm going to spare their feelings. See, you're trying to play the Holy Ghost. Quit trying to spare somebody's feelings and put truth out there and that's that's all you got to do. When I sit here and preach God's word to you guys or teach to you guys, do you know why I don't want to know all the details personal of your life all the time? Some I do, some I don't. But I try not to. Why? Because I get behind this pulpit with the Holy Ghost and I preach God's word. And I've had people in the past come to me and say, well, who told you about this in my life because you're preaching to me? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. If you got convicted of something, it's because the Holy Ghost is doing it, not me. See, I don't want you to ever think I'm up here behind this pulpit pointing you out over something because I know something about you. I'm going to get you. No, God's word will speak for itself. Does that make any sense? Look, y'all, watch this right here. Look, look, look at Ephesians 4. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their minds, having the understanding darkened and being alienated, which means spiritual death, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. It's about as clear as you can get. I'm telling you guys, it's, it's, it's very easy, very, very, very easy for schools, colleges, books, friends, families, culture, to change you. You can be a born-again Christian and love God, but you watch too much Oprah, you're going to change. You read too many wrong books, you're going to change. You hear the wrong pastors for many years, you're going to change. Hello? That's quiet, ain't it? How many of you have been to church for years and years and years and years and years and years and years? You get a joke in a three-point sermon and learn nothing. Okay? It's the same thing I'm talking about. You learn nothing. Why? Because you chose to sit under a pastor who's teaching you nothing. You never read on your own. You didn't challenge anything. It doesn't make any sense. We're going to just tell you a little fact. Christians, I don't care if you're a baseball player. Like right now, you have one or two baseball players standing up or the whole team kneels. He's by himself. You have the same thing with soccer. The same thing with, it's probably coming in football basketball, and they're starting to realize now, oops, all ratings are dropping. Everything's going down. Why? Because America does not want that kind of garbage. But I applaud those people who takes a stance and everybody goes against them and they say, this is what's right. It's biblical. I'm a Christian. You with me? Do you know how sick it makes God feel? You say you're, you say you're a Christian and you ease right in here with them. And now they think you're part of part of them, and inside your heart, the Holy Spirit is saying, "What are you doing? You're a Christian. Why are you why are you doing this? I want you to be different." They don't know because you're hiding it. Y'all been there? I've been there. I'm not saying, I'm not saying bad or good. I'm just trying to show you what happens. So here, guys, in closing, you as a Christian on your job, whether it's baseball or football or basketball or anything you do in life, you're going to be alone. <laughs> very few friends you're going to have in your life. That's just facts. Those who know what I'm talking about, Christians, y'all been there, you don't have a whole bunch of friends. If everybody likes you, you're not doing something right. It's just, that, it's just simply that, that's the way it is. Because I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. So I expect all my college friends and family and folks around me not to like me because I'm not going to be like them. But Greg, don't you want folks to like you? Yeah, I do. But I do that God like me a whole lot more. I do please my papa and do his will than anything else. Look at John 15, verses 19. Watch. If you were of the world, that means system, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world is going to hate you guys if you stand up for what's right. It's going to. Sorry. The world will, but the Christians shouldn't. Romans 12, 2 says this. Be ye not conformed to this world. That means 
You can name it. LGBTQ, transgenders, Black Lives Matters, college, uh, profess, anything. Anything you can think of in your mind. Do not be transformed, conformed to this world system. But what? But what does it say? Here's the other option. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. See, God wants you Christians to be transformed in your mind into His ways, His biblical thinking, and not the world system. It's real simple, guys. Your relationship is going to suffer with God. You won't lose your salvation if you truly are saved. You won't. The first question is, are you really saved? Because the Holy Spirit should be convicting you if you're not doing what He wants you to do. So quit, quit patty-caking with the world system. Quit playing with them. Um... Quit trying to fix everybody. You know, I learned a long time ago. Seriously. And it's amazing. I'm going to tell you some stories right here in closing. I've had people on other jobs I had years ago. And I remember being on those jobs, and I was one of the only Christians in the place I worked at. A couple others called themselves Christians. But I would not budge, would not move off of my biblical principles. Would not move. I go, so what happened? And I was demoted on some jobs. One job I was told, you got to go bring folks to bars and strip clubs and stuff or you can't move up. I'm not doing that. I'll bring them to a Falcons game or a baseball game. That's fine. But I'm not going to that. that I'm a Christian. Then you can't have the job. I said, fine. Give it, give, it, give, it, give it to somebody else. I don't really care. Because that's not more important to me to line my pocketbook than what God says in his word. You choose. Had something happen at Home Depot? You choose God or you choose your job. I chose God. I'm just trying to show you over and over. There's times I've had this happen where I stand on principles and then 20-something years later, not realizing the seed that was planted. I didn't have to go beg and say, believe my way. No. The seed that was planted, 20-something years later, people would come up to me on the streets. I ain't saw you in 20-something years. But one thing I did remember about you and tell me the story, how it touched our lives because I stood up for what was right. That's how God wants you to be. Are y'all understand? y'all seeing this? This is what God wants us to be. So do you have a biblical worldview? Let the Holy Spirit work. See, here's, here's, here's the bottom line, guys. And this is the sad part. If I have someone in my life around me that I love, that's not a Christian. They're living the wrong lifestyle. Have y'all got folks like that in your life? Anybody? <laughs> I know I do. You do. You still love them. But here's the thing. If, if I don't go to them and tell them biblical truth of what God says about it, and I think my love is not to, talk, not to mention it and to kind of go along with what they're saying, what that means is they're going to die one day and go to hell and God's going to look you in the face and say, why didn't you ever tell them? Love, true love is when you say to your friend, I love you unconditionally, but I want you to have peace and joy like I've got. So here's what God says and give it to them. Once you present them truth, not your truth, God's truth, guess who starts working on them? The Holy Ghost starts doing his job. And, he, and I'm telling you, pray. Don't let them sleep, God. Let them toss and turn into bed, God. Let them, let them have a miserable time until they turn over to you, God. That's, that's, a, that's a love prayer. I'd rather see my friend or neighbor or loved one toss and turn into bed and get no sleep until they get right with God where they're supposed to be than to keep on feeding the flame of where they are and it's not in God's will. And at the ultimate end, they're going to die and go to hell. And you're going to say, well, I wish I could go back and do that all over again. I wish I could tell them this. Your opinion don't change anything, but God's word will. Does that make sense? I promise you, God's word is not weak. It's very, very powerful. Because you know what, guys? Even your so-called friends and family and folks like this who's in problems, God's already put it inside them. They already know what's right and wrong. You ain't telling them something new. They already know they should not be doing certain things. I don't care what they've been brainwashed in. God's put it in their heart what is right and what is wrong. 
That's why even an atheist fights so hard to prove God's not real. Because he knows he is. If he didn't, if he didn't believe it, he wouldn't care. Are y'all seeing this, anybody? Let the Holy Spirit work. Does it make any sense? But at the same time, come out, come out from, from among them. Don't be their best buddies. Do not open yourself up to them spiritually. Yes, I'm there for you. I'm here for you. God will put people in your path to plant seeds in. And then sometimes when the season's over with, you move on. Let some other guy come in here and water it. Are y'all seeing this? Hopefully one day they'll get born again or change. But don't open yourself up to that because you don't think that you, you, don't think that you can mess up. I promise you, if you go to college long enough or schools long enough or listen to the wrong programs long enough, you're going to change. Same thing here in church, guys. If you come here long enough, guess what? You're going to change. <laughs> That's a good thing. Spiritually, the Holy Ghost will get the word flowing inside your heart, inside your mind, and it will change things. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all getting a hold of this? Can we can all stand to our feet? I hope you got something out of this. Again, I always preach to myself. Remember, the feast days are coming up. But please start now. Take your time. Really evaluate yourself. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to share with you why in about three or four weeks when we get to the feast day of why I'm telling, telling you to do this. There, there's, a, there's a reason for it. I'm going to tell you now. Right now, the main reason for you is to need to examine yourselves and find out where you are with God. Amen? Because God really, truly wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to bless your socks off. And He will if you'll let Him. If you're here today and you're not born again or saved, please come. I'll give you the opportunity. I always do that. If you're here today and saved, thank God for that. But now, listen to the Spirit of God. If you teach you to come pray for a loved one, then do that. Or a circumstance in your life, then do that. What's, what's your need today? It's nothing too big for God. Amen. Um, I'm glad you guys got, got to come. I hope you learned something today. Try to come back. If you can, I'll keep telling you to do this. Take this message today, click on it, and send it out to your friends and neighbors. Send it out to them out of love. Amen? I promise you, when you do that, you're letting the word be being preached to them. You don't have to say a word. Just let the, just let the video speak for you. You're either going to cut it off or not cut it off or listen to it. It doesn't really matter. That's between them and God. You've done your part. Amen? Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Um, try to come back uh, next week if you can for Sunday school and for Gary's teaching next Sunday night as well. We'll start back on Wednesday soon. I promise you it's coming. Uh, Gary, you mind coming